बताए You're watching Daybreak on Bloomberg Quint Live, and I'm Alex Matthew. Well, this show will help you start your day on the right foot. So let's get started with the headlines. First up, Asian uh, markets have started off on a mixed note as China retaliates against U.S. tariffs. The U.S. has announced fresh sanctions on Russia after the nerve agent attack on former double agent Sergei Skripal and his daughter in the U.K. Oil prices fall to a seven-week low as rising trade tensions overshadowed a drop in U.S. crude stockpiles. The Reserve Bank of India has decided to transfer a cash surplus of 50,000 crore rupees to the government for the year ended June 30. And higher inventory gains aid the quarterly performance of both HPCL and BPCL. On to international news first, and U.S. stocks ended slightly lower on Wednesday as a steep fall in crude oil prices hit energy shares and that offset gains in technology and bank stocks. The S&P 500 slipped after coming within touching distance of a record high following a four-day rise. The Nasdaq, however, just about managed to extend its winning streak to a fifth session as technology shares outperformed the broader markets. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle has all of the action of Wall Street in this report. Stocks finished mixed in Wednesday's Wall Street session with both the Dow and the S&P 500 falling fractionally to slightly the Nasdaq, though, did manage to squeak out a very small gain for its seventh up day in a row, the best daily winning streak since the beginning of March. So lots of strength there for technology. Not surprisingly, tech was the top sector for the S&P 500, helped out by some of the big tech names such as Microsoft, Facebook, Alphabet, Cisco, Intel, among others. Now, of the S&P 500's 11 sectors, five traded higher, six lower on bottom consumer staples and energy. Energy really getting a hit from oil, oil down more than 3%. This is, China did say it will hit U.S. fuels uh, with a 25% tariff starting on August 23rd. So a bit of a ripple effect there to the energy sector. Now, as for some earnings movers on the day, Disney, those shares fell after missing both top and bottom line estimates. Snap also fell. They beat, but daily active users declined on a quarter basis for the first time. Investors not liking that. To the upside, though, Michael Kors, those shares rallied on a big earnings beat, helped by the Jimmy Choo brand. And CVS, those shares higher after beating, boosting the guidance, and also saying that Aetna deal is on track to uh, get through, to pass, to become a part of CVS. And then finally, Tronk, the newspaper company, those shares soaring uh, in the last hour of trading, up more than 10 percent on a report that the company may just sell itself to a private equity firm, perhaps, for between 19 to $20 per share. Investors liking that. Tronk's best day since February. In New York, Abigail Doolittle, Bloomberg News. All right, we're going straight now to Bloomberg's David Inglis, who's joining us from the Hong Kong studio live. Good morning, David. Well, uh, just the tit for tat between the U.S. and the China, that's perhaps the biggest talking point going into trade today, right, in Asia? It is one of the uh, one of the big talking points, of course. I mean, to a large extent, we were expecting the Chinese to uh, to respond. Uh, well, at least I guess to, your, to what you're alluding to, we do have more details on that uh, already at the moment. At least as far as the magnitude of, of their response is concerned, almost uh, a mirror image of, of what the U.S. did did announce a few days back. Uh, is that is that? One of the factors why we're seeing equity markets uh, push lower, maybe. I mean, we're down about a quarter of 1% here uh, on the benchmark. We did see a fairly weak session in the U.S. anyway. Uh, to begin with, uh, lots of other things as well to consider uh, across markets today in the Asia-Pacific, one of which just came out, in fact, four minutes ago, inflation um, out of China uh, coming in slightly higher than estimates, maybe towards the top end, uh, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, I guess in one angle perhaps worth pursuing here is whether or not, and back to your point on the trade angle, 
is, is whether or not the weaker currency might just be adding a little bit too, uh, too much inflationary pressure uh, than needed at the moment. Uh, I'm not saying there is, but certainly that's one angle that might be coming up in the conversations over the next few days or so. Uh, as far as other things we're following, we had the RBNZ uh, out with a rate decision a couple of hours back. Um, the short version is they're not going to move on rates, uh, at least for another two years, and uh, leaving the door open, in fact, also to, to a rate cut. Um, we're seeing the Kiwi dollar obviously uh, much weaker because of that news, and it's pulling down as well yields in New Zealand. might as well also pull down the Aussie dollar, which is, of course, very highly correlated to that. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is in about 25 minutes from now, we're waiting uh, the GDP numbers out of the Philippines. Um, like India, of course, it has been really one of the sort of brighter spots as far as growth is concerned. But also like India, inflation is starting to become a problem. There are, is a uh, fairly big problem already, uh, in fact. So we get a GDP print. Uh, we're expecting a, a 23rd quarter of 6 plus percent growth there in the last 26 for the Philippines. And that does come a few hours ahead of uh, an even more important development uh, in the Philippines, which is the rate decision and uh, for all intents and purposes the central bank there is is essentially widely expected to to hike interest rates it's just a question of how large the rate hike will be uh, the median forecast is a 50 basis point hike there out of the Banco Central in, in, in the Philippines. Quick look across uh, currency markets, a stronger dollar, uh, long story short. So that's a quick look at markets uh, at this point in time. Back to you guys. So much for that, David. All right, uh, just want to bring up uh, the other big talking point for the uh, international space uh, before we head to the Indian markets. The U.S. announced new sanctions on Russia on Wednesday, saying it's uh, made a final determination that Vladimir Putin's government was responsible for the March 4th nerve agent attack on former double agent Sergei Skripal and his daughter in the UK. Nick Wathams of Bloomberg News has this report. It's, it's the result of a, of a statutory uh, obligation that the United States uh, government has. Um, so under, um, under U.S. law, once the U.S. had basically uh, accused Russia of, um, uh, of, of responsibility in this attack, um, it had uh, a, a two months um, uh, to basically make the formal designation, uh, and then it, um, it, and then under which sanctions would then go into effect. Um, so uh, it took a little bit longer than anticipated. Uh, and the, the deadline sort of came and went. Uh, there was no response from the administration, but then finally now. Uh, they have announced that under the 1991 Chemical and Biological Weapons Control and Warfare Elimination Act, uh, they are imposing these sanctions. Um, so, I mean, you, you did see earlier the U.S. expelled uh, 60 or so uh, Russian diplomats as part of the response. Uh, so th the government has, has responded fairly forcefully, and this is a follow-on to that. Do we know what these sanctions, these new sanctions, will entail? Um, I, I think, as far as we know, uh, under the law, there are um, a couple of sort of elements that the sanctions uh, will have. One is um, a, a first round that limits exports uh, and financing, um, but that, that's not expected to really have much Im impact. The, the, the bigger impact will come later uh, when there's sort of a second tranche of, of sanctions uh, that would ban uh, some licenses to uh, export sensitive national security goods to Russia. Um, and, and once that happens, uh, that could really uh, put the pinch um, on Russia. And you could see, um, uh, you know, many millions of dollars uh, affected by those sanctions coming later on. All right. Uh, well, with that, let's uh, turn back home and look at the Indian market and how we're poised uh, for today's session. Darshan Mehta is here to tell you all about that and also, of course, to talk about the futures and options space and the cues he's picking up from there. Good morning, Darshan. Cues from overseas, not necessarily the best. The U.S. market was a little weak and also a little weakness seen in Asia this morning. Yeah, so that's what the SX Nifty is indicating. No major cues also coming in for our markets uh, after market hours yesterday. So uh, we'll deal with cues that can come in uh, as and when they come in trade today. But the SX Nifty slipped into the red. It was up almost five points, uh, almost half an hour ago. It slipped into the reds down almost 16 points at this point of time but nevertheless no concerns as of now it's, it's just trading on the path of how Asia is doing how did the ADR span out in trade the ICICI bank managed to move uh, Tata Motors managed to move so decent news coming in from these four ADRs uh, what didn't do well was uh, Vedanta which was down almost 2% in trade and Dr. Eddie's was down almost 1% in trade now let's take a look at what happened with the broader markets the Nifty
Nifty was up almost 60 points, so there, is, there was buying, but it's now again started to outperforming the mid cap and the small cap end of the market. Let's see how the banking space did manage to pan out. Both the Nifty and the PSU banking index, both of them did manage to hold on for themselves in trade. How did uh, uh, the biggest gainer was the Nifty Energy Index? So Reliance is trading at record highs, and that was one of the key reasons why the oil index did manage to move up significantly in trade. What is not done well is the Nifty Pharma index, which was down almost seven tenths of a percent, post a five percent cut that came in on Lupin. Now, how, how has this week panned out? Metals have done well, media has done well, and energy as a sector has done well in this week. What is not done well in this week is pharmaceuticals, real estate, as well as FMCG. Most of the FMCG counters have started to come off from the from the highs that we've seen. FIs have been net buyers in trade yesterday. They bought in 560 crores. DIs have been net buyers, but overall, FIs still remain sellers as far as this month is concerned. Now, let's take a look at uh, you know the Nifty contribution. The Nifty was up 60 points. Reliance contributed the most 30 points. Half of the move on the Nifty came in only on account of Reliance. Negative cues coming in from Maruti, Lupin, as well as Infosys. Let's see how the FNO market did pan out in trade yesterday. Fresh buying was seen. Open interest buildup was almost 3% on the Nifty. On the Nifty bank also, that may managed to move higher, but that was on account of short covering that saw. Open interest was down almost 2% in trade. As far as positions are concerned, again, call writers are becoming aggressive at the 11,500 mark in trade. They don't want the Nifty to breach below that level, and support will come in at the 11,300 mark. So as of now, it will be between the 11,300 to 11,500 mark in trade. Let's see what happened in trade yesterday. Put writers became much more aggressive from levels of 11,300 to 11,500. Remember, at this level, even though call writers did manage to shed position, this still remains a big support, le big resistance level for the market in trade. Now, as far as uh, the stocks in the FNO banner are concerned, they all remain the same. Adani, the Adani twins, Adani Power, Adani Enterprises, Jet Airways, and PNB Jet Airways will also be reporting their numbers in trade today. How did the PCR pan out? The Nifty PCR managed to move up to 1.76. Let's see how the Nifty Bank PCR also managed to move up to 1.62 at this point of time. Couple of stocks I want to highlight: Volta saw fresh buying, open interest building up was 15% on the long side. You had counters like DV's lab which saw fresh shots on high open interest build up of 12%. DV's had it a fresh 52 week high a few days ago. And uh, Lupin saw fresh shots, high open interest build up of 10%, post an extremely weak set of numbers that they posted. All right, thanks so much for that, Darshan. Let's move now and take a quick check on the rupee and the bond market. Saloni Dhanuka is here with all the details there. Saloni, uh, dollar strength, uh, perhaps still the name of the game, uh, dollar index not uh, too far away from the high points of yesterday. Absolutely, Alex. Uh, in fact, it's on the quantity level. Uh, at the current level, it is trading flat to positive. And uh, in fact, it ended lower yesterday. And that has supported rupees up move yesterday. It ended higher for the second consecutive session at 68.63 levels against the dollar. Now, a record setting rally in the local equity markets too supported the rupees up move. Uh, well, that apart, most Asian currencies were trading higher yesterday after Chinese uh, central bank announced tariffs on US imports. Well, Speaking of the bond market, sovereign bonds uh, ended the day little changed yesterday as 10-year benchmark bond yields ended steady at 7.78%. Now remember, yields have risen almost 9 basis points in the last four trading sessions. On the global front, the dollar index ended lower yesterday for the second day and it trades uh, steady well above the 95 mark in the early Asian hours. Now that apart pound on the other hand slipped almost four tenths of a percent uh, against the dollar yesterday on the back of brexit uncertainties while euro is trading flat against the dollar now despite a slowdown in their german industrial production data and lastly speaking of dollar rupee now it is trading 15 paise higher at 68.47 levels against the dollar in the non-deliverable forward markets, which indicates a positive opening for Indian rupee in today's trade, Alex. Thanks so much for that, Saloni. Shifting focus now to commodities, and Jayesh Kilnani is here with the details. Jayesh, uh, oil uh, falls uh, to, uh, well, significant lows uh, on the latest updates. What do you have for us? That's right. In fact, uh, Alex Oil did manage to slump more than 3% in trade, which is the biggest uh, intraday uh, you know, loss that we saw for uh, WTI since July uh, the 16th. Now, this was uh, on the back of uh, the trade war concerns, which in fact overshow overshadowed the positive U.S. inventory data that we got. Uh, uh, but China is uh, going to impose a 25% tariff on American gasoline and other fuels. Uh, now, however, uh, crude oil will be exempt from this. Uh, the levies, in fact, uh, take place or uh, will take effect uh, from August 23rd. 
Uh, as far as the U.S. Uh, inventory is concerned, we saw a drop of about 1.35 million barrels for last week as per the EIA report. Now, something interesting happened in the base metal space itself. Uh, while the index rose for the second straight day, aluminium was the top gainer in trade, uh, which rose more than 3%. And now, uh, what actually triggered uh, the buying was, uh, you know, uh, there were some buying orders which were placed uh, during the uh, V hours of uh, uh, the LME trading hours in Shanghai. So, you know, there were some mystery traders in Shanghai which actually triggered uh, the up move uh, in London Metal Exchange. And in fact, uh, we have one comment from Tai Wong uh, from BMO Capital Markets who says that the traders in Shanghai were aggressive buyers of not only aluminium but also nickel. Uh, nickel on the back of this also posted its 1% uh, one, 1 up move uh, in overnight session. Uh, however, if you look at the past few days, uh, in the last four days, in fact, nickel has surged uh, more than 1% in each of those, uh, while other base metals like uh, copper, nickel, uh, lead and tin declined marginally on London Metal Exchange. Now, this aluminium rally has in fact continued into the early Asian hours and in Shanghai is currently trading more than 2% higher. Uh, lastly, look at gold prices which are trading uh, with a positive bias for the third consecutive uh, session above the 1220 mark now. All right, thanks so much for that, Jayesh. Interesting points there on the base metals, but the headline uh, remains uh, crude oil going into today. Uh, and it also was a headline yesterday because you had the oil marketing companies that were uh, reporting their numbers for the uh, first quarter. High inventory gains uh, helped HPCL and BPCL post a steady quarter. And now to tell you more about the key details in those reports, uh, you have, we have uh, Somit Sarkar who's joining us with all the details. Somit, good morning. Good morning, Alex. As you mentioned, it was for both the oil marketing companies, it was the higher inventory gains that played out in the first quarter of financial year 2019. Now, for BPCL, if you see, the revenue of the company was up by around 10%, while the EBITDA was higher by close, high, higher by close to 4%. Margins, however, contracted marginally to 5.4%, while the net profit of the company declined by 14%. But that was because in last quarter, the company had higher other income and lower tax rate. Now, inventory gains for BPCL rose six times to close to 2,679 crore rupees while the company also reported a foreign exchange loss of close to 705 crore rupees in the first quarter now on the operational side if you see the gross refining margin came in at 7.5 dollar per barrel aided by higher inventory gains crude throughput however was down by close to 1.4 percent while sales volume were up by around 2.2 2 percent to close to 10.97 million metric tons. On the financial side, if you see the debt of the company was down by around 16 percent to close to 19,683 crore rupees, while other income was down by 34 percent. In this quarter, the tax rate was also higher for BPC at 32.2 percent versus 25.6 percent in the last quarter. Now, for HPCL, if you see the revenue was up by around 11 percent, while the EBITDA was higher by 9 percent. Margins, however, remain largely stable at 4.7 percent, while the net profit of the company declined marginally to close to 1,700 crore rupees. Now, inventory gains for HPCL rose 12 times to close to 1,900 crore rupees, while the company also reported a foreign exchange loss of close to 538 crore rupees in the first quarter. Now, on the operational side, if you see the gross refining margin rose to $7.15 dollar per barrel, aided by higher inventory gains, while the crude throughput was down by close to 2.4% to 4.52 million metric tons. Now, sales volume were up by around 3%, while the capacity utilization remained lower at around 115% versus 119% reported by the company in the last quarter. Now on the financial side, if you see the debt of the company was down by around 29% to close to 14,800 crore rupees, while the tax rate for the company in the first quarter was higher at around 34% versus 26% reported by the company in the last quarter. All right, thanks so much for that, uh, Samit. Well, what are the stocks that you have to watch out for in uh, trade today? Shraddha Babla is here with the Stocks and News. Morning, Shraddha. What do you have for us? Good morning, Alex. I'm going to start with companies which reported earnings after market hours. A very strong set of numbers coming from Nalco, where revenues grew by about 65% and net profit uh, was up by 5.3 times. EBITDA margins also saw a significant expansion from 12% to 34%. Uh, when it comes to Phoenix Mills, it saw revenue growth of about 4.4%, but the net profit uh, growth was much higher at 40%. Even if you look at the operational performance, the margins bumped up from 
44.5% to 47.3%. Uh, Blue Star uh, revenue, while the revenue growth was flat, it was a beat uh, at least on the bottom line when net profit grew by 20% and it was a beat despite an exceptional gain during the quarter. EBITDA margins also expanded from 7.3% to 9.1%. Uh, it seems like a top line beat when it comes to Siemens Limited as well, revenue growth of 16%, uh, but otherwise the numbers seem to be largely in line with estimates. So net profit growth came in at 25% and EBITDA grew by 33%. On the other hand, Thormax numbers were disappointing. <coughs> With a, uh, despite a revenue growth of uh, about 19% and net profit growth of 20%, uh, the operational performance was extremely weak with the margins coming off from 8.3% to 6.7%. So it was a miss as far as Thermax is concerned. SL Propac is another stock which could be in focus and this is on the back of a ET report which says that the promoters may be looking to selling a controlling stake and that a formal sale process could be launched by the month end. So watch out for that name. And finally, we have Salon Exploration where investor Dolly Khanna has bought 0.6% stake uh, via bulk deal yesterday. So she's basically up to a stake. She, uh, Dolly Khanna already held about 1.5% stake as of 30th June. So uh, the stock did move up uh, sizably yesterday itself after its numbers, uh, but possibly uh, further up more likely on the back of this name. All right. Thanks so much for that, Shraddha. Now, it's been a while coming, but IKEA's blue and yellow stores are instantly recognizable. Iconic, monolithic, and now, as India's first store throws open its doors to the masses today, here's a sneak peek into what's on offer. Take a look. sourcing from India by 2020 and is looking to eventually make that into 50%. Now, in the last two years, IKEA has increased its supplier base from 48 to 60. Now, this could also be one of the textile products that IKEA sources from India. It's a fantastic opportunity for us because you see already today in our store, in our range, uh, 1,000 uh, different products made in India and a lot of them have become new. You see a lot of products which are especially made for India because we learned a lot about the needs of the people, how they are living, but also uh, 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 items and home furnishing products what you only need in India, like Idli Maker or Steam Cooker. This, uh, so we have a lot of products just made for India and made in India. We have a lot of textile opportunities. We opened recently a sofa supplier, so we will be supplied by sofas and also the world. We opened a mattress supplier uh, just a couple of months ago. With a fan that's a fantastic uh, example of, we saw what kind of raw materials is available in India. And we were using now uh, coconut fiber in that uh, mattresses, which makes it more, uh, more uh, let's say, air, air conditioned. You can call it like that because it's a very, uh, it's a, uh, it's very good with the coconut fiber and a bit harder. If you're looking to model or remodel your kitchen, you can probably come to this store in Hyderabad. But if you're based outside of Hyderabad in any other city, you'll have to wait till IKEA open its next store, probably in Mumbai, which is expected to open in the next one year, or shop online because that's what they have planned to open to start. Over the next one year. We learned a lot about, not only in India, but we were learning, you know, we were starting with a format of the big stores, everything under one roof, which is fantastic. So you, you, feel, you feel, find everything here, it's a fun day out for you, it's a source for, uh, for inspiration and for home furnishing in the big stores. But then also, not everybody is able today with all the, uh, to, to reach IKEA. Uh, in Hyderabad, it's a bit more easy because we are closer to the city. In Mumbai, we're a bit more far out of the city with the big store. So we totally learned in, in IKEA and then especially in India, we have to be closer where the people are. So we'd like to be with the people in the city. So we are now looking for different, smaller and other formats in the city. So then, uh, because you work in the city, you live in the city, you socialize in the city, that you're able to meet also our range, our people closer to where you are, instead of only traveling two hours uh, to, to come to an IKEA store. In the same time, we are investigating, we are looking to build up the online, a digital uh, infrastructure for us, so that you have an uh, inspiring uh, web page, you can order and get inspired, you can order everything. So the online part we are developing, and the same time also the infrastructure for uh, delivery and uh, the services we would like to have. 
All right, you can soon shop uh, for IKEA furniture online. That's a word coming in from Charlene D'Souza. Let's move on now. New York City Council dealt a political blow to Uber and other app-based car-for-hire companies by approving a one-year industry-wide cap on new licenses and giving the City Taxi and Limousine Commission authority to set minimum pay standards for drivers. Bloomberg's Eric Newcomer reports. It's definitely a blow for Uber to set a cap rather than to sort of uh, grow and shrink with the amount of demand. So it's a major setback for Uber. I'm sure you know plenty of other cities will watch what happens in New York. You know this is a one-year sort of uh, lock-in, so we'll be able to see what happens here, and then other cities will certainly you know learn and and make a decision for themselves, see what impact it has on traffic and wages and everything else. All right, there's clearly lots to talk about over the course of the day, and you'll find all the live market action right here on Bloomberg Quint Live. But there are also several stories on the website that you should consider reading. That's on BloombergQuint.com, so check it out. U.S. fund house T. Rao Price has alleged that two Indian sponsors and their nominee directors on the board of UTI Asset Management have taken control of the board and are disrupting board governance. It has approached the Bombay High Court to instruct authorities to fulfill their supervisory responsibilities by directing the other UTI shareholders and their nominee directors to comply with regulations. The staff at the Reserve Bank of India will go on strike on the 5th and 6th of September over long-pending pension disputes, according to the United Forum of Reserve Bank official, uh, sorry, officers and employees. The decision to go on strike was taken after the regulator and officials from the Ministry of Finance did not approve the forum's demands on revising uh, pension payments for retired officials. All right, the smartphone wars are heating up again. Here's Mark Gurman with all that you need to know about Samsung's soon-to-be-revealed Galaxy Note 9 and about all of the upcoming iPhones. On Thursday, Samsung announces its new, bigger Note 9 smartphone, just weeks before Apple unveils its largest iPhone to date. Reporting from New York, I'm Mark Gurman, and I cover consumer technology for Bloomberg News. Samsung's new Note 9 phone is one of the most anticipated phone launches of the year, as it is the South Korean technology giant's highest-end device. The Note created the phablet phone category a few years ago, and even pushed Apple to go larger for its own phone screens. The phone is famous for having a built-in stylus, and this year's upgrade is expected to have a new Bluetooth stylus that you can use to snap photos from afar, draw, and control music. Like the S9 before it, the Note 9 is expected to have a slightly larger screen, about six and a half inches, and upgraded cameras. It's expected to start north of $1,000, coming in close to the price of an iPhone 10. Speaking of the iPhone 10, the Note 9 will go toe to toe with the new larger version of the iPhone 10 and a new larger low cost iPhone, both of which are expected in September. All right, well, on that note, uh, let me thank all of you for joining in and watching Daybreak on Bloomberg Quint Live. Some of you have reminded me that the Premier League is starting this weekend. I'm very excited and I'm sure you are as well. On that note, thanks so much for watching. Do stay tuned. This is Bloomberg Quint.